Good morning. Welcome to Westview Baptist Church. My name is Rick Bowling. and I'm the pastor at Westview. We're certainly glad you decided to join us today. Hey, if you would like to contribute to the ministry at Westview, you may do so by going online to wbcshelby.org. We certainly appreciate your gifts ahead of time. Well, today we're going to continue our study in the book of Acts in chapter 13. We began that last week with uh, Saul and Paul as he became known and, and Barnabas and their missionary journeys as they were uh, set apart and sent out. They, hands were laid on, prayed over them, and the Holy Spirit said, sent them out, and they began their journeys. Today, on their journey, they are coming back to Antioch, and we're going to jump right into that in Acts chapter 13. So as we look at this scripture, uh, we're going to understand this, uh, the passage or the, the name of the message is from death to life. And, and we certainly think about that in the, uh, the aspect of our physical lives and that one day these bodies will no longer be breathing, our heart pumping, our mind working, all that. And we go into that state. But uh, certainly this is about from spiritual death to spiritual life, if you will. We're going to see all that and how important that is in, in, in this aspect. So let's look at, look at the scriptures. As we jump right in, we begin to see that in chapter 13, uh, we're starting in verse 13. I'm going to give you just a quick overview because we're actually going to start in verses 38. But just to set the stage, Paul, it says, and his companions, they're there. Um, they've returned to Jerusalem or had returned uh, John returned to Jerusalem, excuse me, John Mark was with him. Remember, I spoke about that last week. And he returned to Jerusalem. They go to Antioch. Uh, that's their eventual uh, stop off. And it's on a Sabbath day. And here they are. They go into the synagogue. And so it's interesting, just like we would go into our church today. If you're going into a church, you, if you're watching this, you're probably not. But um, as we would go into a church service and we walk in, and there's all these different things. We have the order of worship, as we would call it. And so there's a welcome, a greeting. Uh, there's a call to worship, a song. And then there's there may be some announcements. And uh, we have scripture reading. We have prayer. We might have a, a solo or some special music. We may have another song. And then we have the message, the person that's going to give up and stand up and give the message of exhortation. Well, they did some of the same things. They had the reading of the, of the they called it the law and the, and the prophets. That would be a book out of, something read out of the first five books of the Bible, what we call today, and then something from the prophets. And, and a lot of these different types of things were taking place then. And so they're in the synagogue, all this, and then they would invite someone uh, to come up and have the word of exhortation. So obviously Saul and uh, his companions were there, and he had a, a reputation that had come before him. And so they asked him, they sent someone up to, to say, brothers, you know, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, a word of encouragement in the Lord, please speak. And so standing up, Paul motions with his hands and he looks around and he says, fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. It's kind of like Jesus said, barely, barely I say unto you. He's saying, this is important. And he begins to kind of do what Stephen did Stephen the deacon, who before he was stoned, and he gave a historical recitation of all the way back in the Old Testament of what happened with uh, the calling of the Israelites and how they were chosen, and then how they spent, you know, 400 years, 450 years when you count the wilderness and, and uh, the 10 years after the Jordan and the 400 years in Egypt, 450 years they called that a wilderness living where they were in bondage those 400 years in slavery in Egypt. He speaks about all that, that those things that are taking place and their deliverance from Egypt. And, and then eventually how, you know, they wanted, uh, the judges were appointed and then they wanted a king and they got Saul and Saul was not really, he was interested in Saul more than he was in God. And, and then David who comes along and, and how he was chosen. He was a man after God's own heart. And how the promise of Christ would come through his lineage after the establishment of a kingdom that would live forever. Not David's kingdom, but the kingdom of God. And so those promises were given to David. And so he, he does all this. And, and then he begins to, to talk about these, these things that, that they were witnesses. You know, John, uh, finally the, the Savior comes, Jesus. 
and many of them were witnesses and these people who came in Acts chapter 1 we see that in the first cut in a few verses there and uh, it's interesting as we look at that the fellow children of Abraham he says you God fearing Gentiles it's to us the message of salvation that has been sent and so now since Jesus has come and this the uh, the gospel has been given and they talked about what happened to Jesus the fact that he had this ministry and how he was uh, it was prophesied what was going to take place by the prophets and and now it was taking place it actually was happening and Jesus began to that earthly ministry and then how he was persecuted how he was crucified but then on the third day the good news that he rose again this good news that was not just for the chosen Israelites but for all who would believe who all who would follow for the Gentiles as well and he gets right up into this passage where we are now remember he's speaking in the synagogue he's in this church he's telling he's given this historical recollection of everything that's taken place just like Stephen did and now this is what he says in verse 38 he says therefore my friends I want you to know that through Jesus the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you now this first thing I want you to see today I'm going to use an adage that we've used in, in the United States but I'm going to take it in a, in a little bit different direction the first point is let freedom ring now we've heard that let freedom ring in the United States it means the ideals of life of liberty and the pursuit of happiness should be spread you know over the earth and, and it allowed to flourish but what we're going to look at is the ideals of, of life of eternal life of of what it means to live that of, of liberty of that mean would mean freedom freedom from sin freedom from death and the pursuit not of happiness but of joy joy in the Lord a joy that's eternal and that the joy that comes on and know, only in knowing Jesus Christ that that will be spread through the earth and that's allowed to flourish as we continue to plant the seeds because it is life-giving so the very first thing he does in verse 38 he says therefore my friends I want you to know that through Jesus the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you there's this offer of forgiveness an offer that's a divine offer you know we have homes right now are selling at a premium people are making offers that are unreal you know in real estate and and yes people can refuse them but uh, the people who are selling it's it's a it's just a pretty sweet deal as they would say but this is the deal of a lifetime it is of your life it is for your life an offer of forgiveness something that that even we're going to see that the law couldn't justify fully for all of sinfulness all of our sinfulness and God is saying through uh, Saul or Paul here he's saying to them look I'm giving you an offer this is like this is this is it there's never going to be another offer like this and it's offer of the forgiveness of everything that you've done against God and now some of these were high-ranking you know people in the synagogue and and they were righteous and unfortunately some of them were self-righteous and here are these men and they're speaking this but now they've spoken the scripture but now they're they're giving them some things that are kind of tough to swallow because it goes against the moral code of the law some of them and so he's saying I want you to know that through Jesus and they saw many of them thought Jesus was just this man but he's the Savior that through Jesus the forgiveness of sins uh, of sins is proclaimed to you it's offered to you right now not just as something I'm reading about but we are offering that to you in the name of Jesus in fact he says through him everyone who believes is set free from every sin a justification you were not able to attain under the law of Moses because see you know you have to think for a minute in the, in the law of Moses in the law I don't know if you remember some of the, uh, Jesus's teachings were like okay well you say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth you know but he talks about loving those who you know uh, persecute you and praying for those and blessing those who, who want to try to kill you things that were so contrary to the law and the justification for some of those things was an eye for an eye of someone 
killed someone and that person was killed. You know, they were corporal punishment 101 right there. Uh, different things that took place within the scripture in many different ways. Uh, you know, if a person committed adultery, then that person, uh, death was one of the things that were to take place. And so there were certain things that the law would bring death to people, actually physical death, but also that death that they felt like they, there were certain places they just couldn't be forgiven, no matter what they did. And Jesus is saying, I'm giving you the opportunity. I'm giving you a justification. All you have to do is, make, I'm going to make you right before God by just placing your faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. He's saying, this is the way. He's the Savior of the world. And that I'm saying that everyone who believes is set free from every sin. Every sin. We know that denial of the Holy Spirit is the unpardonable sin, Jesus said. And that is what's happening here when God is wooing you, when the Holy Spirit's wooing you to Jesus and rejecting it. Yes, because you're rejecting Christ. And so the Holy Spirit it, it's, is wooing, hopefully, the people there. And I pray that if you're not a follower of Christ, he's wooing you right now. And that you can be, you may have had something in your life that you have done. I don't know what that could be. It could be anything. We talked about an eye for an eye. Maybe it was, uh, you know, um, something as a, a young person that you did that was uh, fatal. It was fatal to another person, their physical life. Maybe it made an impact on them the rest of their life physically, maybe emotionally, mentally. God forgives every sin. If you will believe in Christ, he will allow you to step into that freedom. I want to encourage you with that. You can be free no matter what if you place, place your faith in Christ. And so he's trying to, to get that very important point across to them. It's a life-giving one. Well, there's, there's a warning because not everybody's going to accept this. And this is what he says. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. And he quotes a quote from Habakkuk 1.5 in the Old Testament. He says, look, you scoffers. Now, he's quoting a quote saying, I don't want this to happen to you is what he's telling them. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish. Wonder and perish. In other words, you know, just start thinking about this and going, you know what, I don't know. I just don't know. He says, for I'm going to do something in your day that you would never believe, even if someone told you. And so he's really trying to get their attention, a warning. He's saying, look, I've given you this offer. Do not reject this offer. Like he said in other scripture, it's going to be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. That's not a scare tactic. It's a matter of fact. And so the warning is, look, guys, this is it. Do not reject this. I say that to you today. If you're hearing the message, accept this message that God has given you that, that if you place your faith in Christ, that all your sins will be forgiven. And you can have that eternal life. A warning, he's saying, that you do not want to reject that offer. Offer of forgiveness, a divine offer. And when you do, let me tell you, freedom will ring unlike it ever has before. It won't be a man-made freedom. This is a God-made freedom. And so that brings you from death to life, from that spiritual death that could be an eternity uh, in hell to eternal life with Jesus Christ in the presence of God. And so that's the beauty of it. And it's not just then, it's now. It starts today. It starts in this moment when you accept Christ that you begin to have, he says, abundant life in Jesus Christ. Abundant life. Remember, if you have, you're saying, but you, no, you just don't know how bad that sin is. That's not God speaking. That's the enemy. The enemy, the, the uh, Satan, said, Jesus said in John 10, 10, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's trying to get you to believe that lie, but you can't be forgiven. He says, but I have come to give you life, life to the fullest. You see the beauty in that? You go from that death of not being able to feel like you could ever be forgiven to life and freedom. That you can live the life that Christ has intended for you. Well, folks, there's always going to be next steps. When, when things happen, and you're going to see right here what happens with Paul as we look at verses 42 through 43. That was 38 through 41. The second point is there's always next steps. Let's look at verse 42. 
as Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, it says the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. So, you know, here they are in church. We, we call it on, they would call it on Saturday. We were in church on Sunday. And they spoke and they gave these words. And the people in the synagogue, as they're leaving, they're like, come, we want you to come back. We want to hear more about this. We want to hear more about what you have to say about this Jesus. And, and so um, we see that God, God's going to give you an opportunity to share. If you get to share, um, he's going to give you an opportunity to share again. It's not just necessarily a one-time thing. It may not be in a church. It might be in somebody's house. It might be one-on-one. -on -one. They're going to want to know more most of the time. Sometimes they're going to reject it. We'll talk about that as well. But God will always give you the opportunity to share. Just know that. And we just have to be open to it. So we see in the scripture what happens. It says that, that when the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and the devout converts, those would be what we would call proselytes. These were people that had been converted to Judaism. They had been actually circumcised. They would have been a, had become Jewish believers, and which was a little bit different than the Gentile, what we call God-fearers. Those were ones that, that recognized uh, and worshiped the God of, of Israel, just like the others did, but they had, had not converted to Judaism. They didn't observe all those things. They just knew that God was, that was the God that they were to worship. And so these were the ones because they wouldn't have had a, they would not have had an opportunity to be able to, to as we would say, they weren't church members, they, the God fears, but these were the Jews and the, the devout converts of Judaism. And so they follow Paul out and Barnabas. Just think about, you got this speaker that, in your church and man, he, you're wooed by the message that's been given. And so the, the church members, you know, maybe that you could be, these were the charter members of the church and people who had come and joined the church later on. They're coming out and saying, yeah, man, come on back next week to church. We want to hear more about what you've got to say. And they talk with them. And so, you know, here they are. The, the Holy Spirit is going to woo these other people. He's going to woo people with his message. That's what he was doing right here. The message that you're going to give, he's going to, you don't have to convince them. God will do that. And so, you know, we see that, that Paul and Barnabas, here they are. They're taking the, these next steps. There was next steps. They're asked to come back. And there's and, and the Holy Spirit, they're seeing what's taking place. And finally, this is says, after it says, after they followed him out and they talked with him, then then it says that Paul and, and uh, Barnabas, they urged them to continue in the grace of God. Now, uh, you know, we must be an encourager to others to continue on. Yeah, they were kind of they were coming back, but they said, you know, in the meanwhile, continue to to seek the Lord and the grace of God. You know, don't fall away. Uh, yeah, we'll be back, but continue to do that. Always be an encourager to people, no matter what. When you walk away, just like this message, you can encourage that this is a life giving message. It takes you from that spiritual death to to uh, spiritual life, eternal life, and that's the encouraging part. And so there are always going to be next steps, but the final thing I want you to see today, though, is there's, there's other times where we're going to see where people will retreat. And when you retreat, it is death. People fall back. But if you're going to go forward, it's a forward march means life. So retreat equals death and forward march equals life. Look at this last part of this passage, starting with verse 44. On the next Sabbath... It says almost the whole city, they gather to hear the word of the Lord. So now Paul and Bar they're back. They're back in the, in the synagogue. They're back at church, as we would say. They've come back to give that message next Saturday, as it would be then. And it says that, that uh, in the scripture that when the Jews saw that the, cry the crowds, they, and the Jewish people there, they're seeing all these people. In fact, think about this. The whole city gathered. We couldn't get the whole city in our church. We could, you know, if we were in the biggest auditorium in Cleveland County, where we are, we couldn't fit everybody, but people would be on the grounds and maybe we'd have a speaker system, but we, we wouldn't expect that. And so all these people are there and a, a lot of people that were Jew, uh, the Gentiles were there. And so when the Jews saw the crowds, it says they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying, and they heaped abuse on them. Now, all these people are coming in. Can you imagine 
worried about them maybe taking some of their seats there on their pews, as we would say. You know how uncomfortable some people in churches have can become with that, with new people coming in, people that that maybe don't look like them or, or act like them or whatever, or they don't believe like them, but yet they still want to reach people for Jesus. And so here these people are there, and and they knew they came back because of this word that, that Paul had already given. And so they began to get real jealous all of a sudden. You know, and Paul here, who was a, a leading Pharisee in the synagogue, who basically had become a Christian now, and he was preaching a whole new message. It was the message of the Old Testament being fulfilled. That was the part that was hard for them to believe. Well, here they are. You got to understand that growth requires acceptance with God's creation. We have to, that's when we're growing, we have to accept. There are going to be people that are going to be coming in and they're going to be doing things or done things just like anyone else has done. And maybe you haven't committed certain sin or been in certain circles. It doesn't matter. Because I have to remember what scripture said, woe is me to judge. And, and let me tell you, God ain't playing, as they say right here. He's saying, accept it, just as I have accepted you, accept one another. And so we see that. And uh, there is a, a beautiful picture of that. I'll share this quick story. I saw this video the other day of this 11-year-old little boy. And uh, he's been out of his church for 15 months. He has Down syndrome. But the church, and, and they have a special needs, needs ministry. They work with kids from autism and all, all kinds of different special needs, Down's kids and so forth. And so this video is this picture of him coming back to church for the first time. And they have a one-on-one -on -one buddy system. So this person goes and all these kids get to have worship together, to learn about Christ together, and they just love it. And so for the first time in 15 months, they come and there's this, the, the, the one-on-one worker and the, the little 11-year-old boy run down the hallway and they're embracing each other. And there's this beautiful uh, reunification, if you will, as they come together. And so as uh, they were interviewing the mom and, and, and the person interviewing, they were talking and says, you know what? This, folks, I'm going to quote, is what, is what making a seat at the table, the table of God is what I'm, I know they're talking about, at, at the table for everyone looks like. You know, as the mother's crying, watching this, and, and this little boy, is, uh, and this lady's name was Grady and Katie. To see Grady and Katie reunited, she says, in such a beautiful way was epic. I feel like, she says, it was a little taste of heaven on Sunday morning in the form of acceptance and inclusion. You see, God ain't playing. Just as that they were accepted and they embraced each other, he's saying we have to accept other people right where they are because he's done that with us. He's done it with Rick Bowling, myself. He continues to do that. And that's the beautiful thing that when we look at this uh, of this passage, that when we don't do that, I mean, when we retreat back from that, it is death. But when we do, it's the life-giving, the life of this 11-year-old little boy and this worker, the spiritual life, the life of Christ being alive and Oh, it was awesome to see that. Well, it doesn't stop there. Let's keep going as we finish this up. Verse 46, 45. He says, Then Barnabas answered them boldly. He came boldly and he says, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it, they are rejecting because they're, now they're rejecting. He says, And do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. He says, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the, let me tell you, when the Gentiles heard this, they were like, woohoo. I mean, they were, they were pumped. They were glad and honored of the, of the word of the Lord, it says. And all who were appointed to earth to eternal life, all those believed in Jesus Christ that day. And there would be more to come. It says, and the word of the Lord spread throughout the whole region. You see what I was talking about, about letting freedom ring? And from death to life. And, and so here they are. The truth is the truth. And what he's saying is accept it. This was a prophetic word that was given to Sim, uh, throughout the scriptures. But we see it fulfilled when Simeon goes into the at uh, Jesus' dedication. Or, uh, and uh, his circumcision, excuse me. But I well, know he comes into the dedication of the temple, yes. And, and, and he says, 
my life is, is I, I'm good now. Everything's been fulfilled. I can go and be with Christ or be with God in the Christ. And he says, you know, but because, and this is what's going to take place, is I be, it's become a light for uh, the Gentiles and a salvation to the ends of the earth for the, uh, and for Israel as well. Accept the word. The truth is the truth. Work through the word and embrace God. Embrace that freedom that you can have. And finally, there's going to be times you have to move on so you won't retreat back to death and you can stay forward marching to life. Look what he says in the very end of this. But the Jewish leaders, it says, incited the God-fearing women of high standing, and, and that would be Gentile women that were in, uh, in, the, in the, I guess, the social circles in the society that had a lot of influence on these men that had a lot of power. And it says... The leader and the standing, uh, the leading men of the city, stirred up the persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. You can't come back. What did they do? They did exactly what Jesus said to do. When you offer peace to to someone's house, in this case to the people in their church, and he says they shook the dust off their feet. That's what he told them and move on. He says warning them. He warned them and he went on to Iconium. It says, and the disciples, they were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. He's saying, when this happens, move on. Just move on. Ain't nobody going to steal your joy in Jesus Christ. And so there's times we have to do that. And sometimes when you move on, it may be in the void that they start searching and later they come to know Christ. But it's okay because there's going to be others that want to hear what you have to say. I hope you've wanted to hear what we had to say today. And so with this, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and close. Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you that as we come, Lord, Lord, you offer life to us. Life, Lord, from, from the death of sin and all that, that goes with that, Lord, that through our place and our fight, faith in you, Jesus, that we can have eternal life and be forgiven for all of our sins. I pray as you are hearing this today, if this is new for you, Lord, that I mean for, for you as a person, Lord, that you accept this divine offer so that you too may have eternal life and that you may go from death to life, not only in eternity after your physical death, but beginning now today that you get to experience that abundant life. You do that today and I promise you, your life will never be the same. Lord, help us as a church. To open our arms wide, just like we saw with this little boy. To all those that come in, Lord, to share the truth with them. Lord, to allow you to change the hearts of people. To change our hearts, Lord, so that we too may live the gospel out in Jesus Christ. For it's in his precious name and his blood that we pray. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today. And I pray that if you accepted Christ today, I would love to hear from you. Uh, you can, again, reach me at wbcshelby.org or contact a local pastor in your area, a trusted friend possibly that's a believer if, if that's not available, and, and begin this journey from death to life and you'll never regret it. God bless you.